I'm Paul Harris. I'm Director of Library Services here at UCL, University College London, and I'm also the UCL Copyright Officer, which means I look after all the IPR arrangements that um, academics and students are concerned with here. Uh, in another part of my work, I'm also President of LIBA, which is the Association of European Research Libraries, and so I look after library and IPR issues on a European scale as well. UCL has taken quite a proactive stance on copyright and IPR management here in the university. We're probably the most active university of any in the Russell Group in terms of how we manage IPR and how we manage copyright issues. We have two copyright policies here in the university, uh, a copyright policy for staff and then something completely new, which you won't find in many universities, a copyright and IPR policy for students. The student policy was written in response to uh, requests from students for advice on copyright and IPR issues, and the university realised that there was a need for a separate student policy to address the concerns that students had about their work and how they used other people's work. And so when we produced the student IPR policy and it went through the relevant committees, we were really rather pleased because that is a major contribution to supporting the student experience and to helping students understand some of the trickier issues about copyright and intellectual property right management. The student policy covers two broad areas of work. First, it helps the student to understand how to use what we call third-party materials, that is books, uh, journal articles, images, uh, music, art, that have been produced by somebody else. All these have rights attached. And it's important that the student realises that and understands how to use that material in their work without infringing other people's copyrights. So that's one area of the policy, which was actually greatly appreciated by students because third-party rights are something that actually really rather, confuse, uh, rather confuses them. The second main area of the policy is, is, is something new, which is new to all universities now as we work increasingly in a digital environment. And that is how to protect and how to exploit your own rights in the work that you produce. Think about it. If you're a third-year student, say, in the Bartlett School here in UCL, uh, engaged in art, design and architectural work, as part of your undergraduate project in your third year, you will be producing designs or models or, or software which is commercially exploitable. Now, according to the UCL policy, the student owns the right in their own outputs. So they own the copyrights in their works. And what UCL has tried to do is, is create a copyright framework so that students know how to protect their rights and then how to use the material that they've used for their own benefit because they're the copyright owner. It's not the university that owns the material, uh, owns the rights in the material they're producing. It's the student. Now, this is something completely new in a student environment. When I was a student, no one ever thought about student copyright. No, that wasn't really an issue because we didn't then work in a digital environment. It's wor working in a digital environment that makes these things much more immediate and much more pressing for the student. And there is a market there in terms of how they exploit their work, how they exploit their rights, and they need to understand what their rights are and how they can make best use of them. The UCL Open Access Policy, which is going through the committees at the moment, will be finally uh, signed off, I hope, at the end of this month, is an institution-wide mandate for research outputs. The mandate says that where copyright permissions allow, a copy of all research materials produced by UCL staff should sit in the UCL uh, repository, which is being renamed as UCL Discovery. The student policy does talk about research outputs, so, for example, research theses that uh, our research students, our PhD students, produce. We produce about 500 research theses a year for um, research degrees. 
Uh, we expect these, a copy of these, to be deposited in the repository and where the student gives permission, and only when the student gives permission, that research thesis is made available in open access. We believe that's good for the student because um, visibility to their work appears at a much earlier stage in their career. It makes them more employable because employers, potential employers, can read the material they produced for their research degree. And UCL has also begun to use that material for marketing purposes because when a research student picks a university to study at, one of the first questions they ask is, well, what other work has been done in that department? What has that supervisor uh, produced in terms of research students that is relevant to the kind of work that I want to do? So making stuff available in open access like that, when the student allows it, actually helps the university as well because the material acts as a marketing tool to attract other students to come to the university to study. When you talk to a student and ask them about copyright issues and what, and what concerns them, they normally say you no know, one of a, a couple of things. Uh, the first is that they don't really understand what copyright means. They know it exists, but they don't know what the implications of copyright legislation are, and they don't know how to tackle it. So, for example, a student might say, well, I want to copyright this piece of work, what form do I have to fill in to get it copyrighted? Well, of course, in, in, in UK legislation and in EU legislation, copyright doesn't, doesn't need to be registered. It's like an act of creation. It inheres in the material simply through the fact that the student has created it. So it doesn't need to be registered. It, it, it exists already. That's quite a, a novel concept for many students. Other students will say, well, how do I... I, I know I want to use these images. Oh, and I know I want to use that piece of video that's on the web. C can I do that without breaking copyright laws? Well, of course, the answer to that is it all depends on the conditions in which that material was, was made available. Images could be uh, freely available if they're, if they're open access. They might have licence conditions attached to them, so the student might need to make a, a payment to include... Uh, third-party images in their work. What we do in the library, we, we do two things. We have a teaching and learning section here which advises on copyright issues. It mainly advises academic members of staff when they want to produce course materials which include uh, copyright material. But increasingly, that section also answers questions from students about how they can use third-party material in their own work and in their own productions. And something which is completely new, which you won't find in any other university, probably anywhere in the UK, the library also offers copyright and IPR classes to graduate students. We started doing this at the request of our graduate school here in UCL because we were, get, we were getting so many questions from students about copyright issues and how they could protect and exploit their own rights in the work that they produce. Now, you might think that copyright is not the most interesting issue to be discussed in, in, in a seminar, but those classes are always full. We hold them several times a year. Uh, they're voluntary. They're, they're, not, they're not compulsory. But students volunteer to sign up for them because they realise that copyright and IPR in a digital environment is something they need to know about. And this is one of the few ways in which a student can learn more about copyright in, in a very straightforward way. In, in the classes that we hold and in all the guidance that we produce, we, we do give students all the information we can about the different types of licensing schemes that are available. Students don't have to make their material available in open access and unless they want to. The institution doesn't insist because it's the student that owns the rights in, in the materials that they produce. And so it's up to the student to choose what sort of licenses, if any, they attach to their work. We do encourage them to attach licenses and our advice is that they, uh, the open access framework is a good model to use 
And so they should be using things like Creative Commons licenses to attach to their work, to, to, to manage the dissemination and the exploitation of the work that they're producing. Of course, they can sign their rights over to a, a third party, to, to, to a publisher, if they want to, and some publishers still request copyright assignment in order to publish a book, particularly a, a monograph or a, a journal article. We, we advise students not, not to do that, not, not to sign over their rights. We advise academic members of staff not to assign copyright as well. In the 21st century, the best way to manage your rights is, is not to assign them to a third party, but to give people a non-exclusive licence while retaining the rights yourself as the creator. You can uh, grant a non-exclusive licence to a publisher to allow them to publish uh, the work that you want to put into the public domain if you want to use commercial means of publication. That's quite acceptable. We do encourage people to think seriously about the licences that they um, use and to make sure that they're not signing away their rights and any money-making opportunities that accrue from that uh, to, to a third party because that's the, not the modern way of managing copyright and IPR. Primary data is, is, is a particularly interesting um, issue. Uh, in a, a paper environment, no one ever really thought a lot about primary data because it was difficult to disseminate and make available. Publishers weren't interested in, in publishing primary data because uh, it was seen to be not uh, appropriate uh, to accompany a journal article or a book with all the, the building blocks that make up the discussion in, in, in the published output. In a, in a digital environment, it's perfectly possible to share the data as well. And so one of the, the really interesting topics that libraries and academics are talking about now is how to get the primary data out there as well and to share that with um, other researchers in other parts of the world or to let students use primary data to check the findings of a research article, say, if, it, if they're in their third year. That's something that they might well want to do to check the methodology and, and the results. Data per se isn't copyrightable, it's, it's brute facts, so you can't copyright primary data. But in a, in a European environment, there are rights attached to primary data through the European Database Directive, because the Database Directive protects people who spend a lot of time uh, compiling databases and adding primary uh, data to a, a database that they're maintaining the database directive recognises that that should be protected. And so by the act of compilation and, and management of that database, um, there are rights in the database that you can't simply infringe and overrule. So although primary data itself is not copyrightable, given the framework in which we work, there are rules and regulations that students and academics and researchers need to know about. And these are the types of issues that we tackle in our copyright classes to give people greater assurance that when they're using this sort of material, they're using it well, and they're using it safely, and they're using it responsibly. We have here in, in UCL the concept of global citizenship, where our students go out and follow a career anywhere in the world and, and can be a leader in their chosen profession. Good copyright management and good IPR management is part of global citizenship, because wherever you're working, in whichever part of the world, there will be copyright frameworks and legislation that you have to comply with. So we're teaching our students now how to deal with those frameworks so they're equipped with the skills and knowledge for their later careers. Open access repositories are, are well developed in Russell Group universities in the UK and UCL's uh, repository, shortly to be renamed as UCL Discovery, is, is no exception. We, ha we have a mandate uh, so that where copyright permissions allow, all published research outputs should be deposited freely in the repository. We check the copyright uh, framework using the Sherpa Romeo listing for every textual uh, output, article or monograph that is deposited in the repository. M most publishers now will allow some form of deposit in the 
repository. It may be embargoed for a certain period. It may be the final manuscript with reviewers' comments rather than the publisher PDF. But most repositories, in fact, all repositories that I know in the UK will religiously use the Sherpa Romeo listing to check copyright permissions. And the Nottingham team have developed the Sherpa Romeo tool to such a sophisticated level that actually it's quite easy to do that now. Most publishers realise that open access is part of the modern scholarly environment and will work and develop their copyright policies so that they are aligned with the emerging open access movement. Many research students now who come to UCL and to major research universities may well be sponsored by private companies or may well have private funding to enable them to undertake their course of research. And in today's rather difficult financial environment, I think that's going to be a more prominent part of uh, the research experience in research universities. It can often be confusing to the student to know how to manage the uh, copyright and the outputs that they're producing because there are many stakeholders involved in the, the research. There's UCL itself, of course, which, if you're a scientist, might well be providing lab space and equipment. There's the student themselves, uh, and there's also the uh, commercial company who's providing funding for the uh, research. What we teach in our copyright classes and what the UCL copyright policy uh, insists on is that all the arrangements for managing copyright and IPR are clear at the outset, before the student arrives to start work on day one. And our advice, is, my advice as UCL copyright officer, is that there should be a contract between the student, UCL, and the commercial funder so that it's perfectly clear who owns the rights in the outputs that are being produced. It's up to the student to decide that in, in, in conversation with the funder. Of course, we would like, I, as an open access advocate, would like the outputs to be available in open access on day one. I can quite see from the commercial sponsor's point of view that they may not want that, and there may be an embargo period. And that's what would be um, written into the contract. So the contract would make clear when, who owns the rights, how long, if there is an embargo period, that, that embargo will last. And then after that, the material hopefully can be made available in, in open access to comply with the UCL uh, mandate for open access publication where copyright permissions allow. If we were starting from scratch and I were advising other universities, as I, I sometimes do in Europe, what steps they should take in copyright management, I, I'd say there are probably two or three things that they, that, that they need to do to, to start with. And none of these is particularly easy, so I, I'm not suggesting they're easy things to do. Um, the first thing is to align all your institutional policies and strategies around a, a, a pan-university copyright and IPR framework. Now, we've done that here in UCL. We have the two policies, the copyright IPR policy for staff and uh, a similar one for students. It took four to five years to, to generate those policies, to get buy-in from the academics and from students, and then to see what the impact of those policies were on other uh, university strategies and high-level policies. We have now aligned all the policies, so they're all uh, proceeding in, in the same direction. That's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it's very, uh, on one level, it's very straightforward. Uh, you, 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 you can say, well, yes, the university must have a copyright policy and a clear framework, but the devil's in the detail, and getting the de it's the detail, getting the detail right uh, takes time. But I think that's where modern universities should start. I think the second thing that I would advise universities to do is to start holding training classes for academic members of staff, certainly for students, to raise awareness 
about copyright issues and to get them thinking about what their rights and privileges are in this new um, digital environment. We've done that here in UCL. And as I say, the, the courses are very, very popular and always oversubscribed by graduate students who want to learn about their own rights and to avoid infringing other people's rights. The third thing I'd suggest, which many people might not find a sensible thing to do, but I'm going to suggest it anyway, is move copyright management from an administrative area of the university to the library. There aren't many university librarians in the UK who are also copyright officers. Copyright tends to be administered and managed as a, a, a purely administrative function elsewhere in the university, in, in many other places in the UK. I'm sure they do a fine job, but libraries are particularly well-placed to take forward the copyright discussions in a university environment and are tuned in to modern developments like open access, so that for libraries it's a natural thing to extend our experience in metadata, in managing access to, to copyright and IPR. And I'm not saying that because it's me, but in UCL I think we've made particularly fast progress. Five years might not be fast, but in copyright terms it is quite speedy. I think we've made particular advances here in UCL because the library has been entrusted with this role and we've been able to take it forward and align it with modern trends in scholarly publishing and dissemination. And I think I would recommend to other universities to consider doing the same.